Hey, I saw the new Spider-Man movie. Let's talk about it. So going into the sequel of one of the most popular and successful animated movies of the decade was no easy task for the team involved. Into the Spider-Verse won so much praise across the industry. It beat out two Disney releases in its year at the Oscars, it showed the audience and the industry as a whole that animation can be more than what Disney and DreamWorks have been safely doing for the past few years. And the industry listened. A couple years later, DreamWorks released their own films with an art style that took much inspiration from Spider-Verse, albeit with their own unique looks and films. And it looks like Disney would be releasing their own soon. When the first film is such a monument of a movie, it's clear the sequel has a very high bar to clear. Did it meet that bar? E yes, for the most part. Yo, so this is rare that I'm talking about a film that is still in theaters, so I don't know how to do this. But here's what I'm gonna do. So I'm gonna have a proper spoiler free review with a beginning, middle and end. And then at the end, I will put a spoiler tag review where I go very into the details and stuff. But don't worry, you can click off when I get to that because I'll make sure that I still have a proper conclusion and I can still get my points across without getting into spoilers. Okay, sound good? All right, end of punch in. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about the movie as a whole. Obviously, the marketing didn't lie to you, there are a lot of unique and varying art styles in this movie. Gwen has this beautiful watercolor style where the background changes colors with her mood, causing the scenes in her world to be some of the most emotionally powerful and visually immersive. There's another character that has this grungy newspaper style that's rough and aggro, which fits their personality and vocal performance. There's a few characters that have those anatomy wireframe drawings in their faces and bodies that are just baked into their character designs. And they just work. Every frame is genuinely a painting and there's so much that you don't see in one viewing. This movie is begging to be rewatched again and again. Alternatively, you can just take the matte pad approach and go frame by frame with it to really soak in the effort the artists and animators put for this movie. But you knew that. Wait, what, what about, about the story? Do? For the first movie, the story at its core was quite simple. But the multiple alternate spider people and the huge stakes mission really elevated the grounded core into a very emotionally powerful story. This film takes a similar approach, where it kept the core grounded but surrounded it with a lot of fluff. One may argue, too much fluff, as it does get overwhelming at times. It's not easy to focus on the main thread because five things are happening all at once and the movie barely slows down. But that's not to the movie's detriment, it makes the movie endlessly rewatchable because of that, for you to get all the plot lines, all the jokes, all the references, and all the background gags at your own time and pace. But when you're comparing it to the first one, which focused itself in one world, had a small number of characters, and used a lot more grounded fight scenes, it does feel like they went a little too big with everything. Again, not saying it's bad, but the much better core barely shines with how much excess there is. Speaking of, let's just go back to the core. Similar to No Way Home, it plays with the rules of a typical Spider-Man story. They both pose a lot of similar questions and trolley problem dilemmas for the heroes to go through, and makes the heroes come to similar points. I love the directions this movie takes as compared to No Way Home, as it uses the concept of its multiverse to its full potential here. Speaking of directions, the way this movie set up its major plot beats is incredibly masterful, as it used simple, innocuous details from the first movie to its advantage, both for the humor and for the narrative drama. It genuinely does make you feel like Lord and Miller have had an idea of where to take the trilogy even before we knew they were getting a trilogy, even though that wasn't really the case. But the direction, while stellar, isn't flawless. Because of there being a lot of extra fluff in there, there's a few times where you're waiting for the story to keep going. Why are we here? What's the point of this? Don't get me wrong, it's entertaining as hell, but a little extra at times. I'll explain this in more details in the spoiler half, but let's wrap up this half with my closing thoughts. So this movie is a really, really good follow-up. It understood the excitement of it being a Spider-Man story, still pushed the limits of animation to a new benchmark, and is our biggest example as to why AI can never be a full replacement for humans in the art sphere. I give it a 9 out of 10. On par with the first. Can't wait for Beyond with a proper film with a beginning, middle, and end. Segway to... It's pretty clear that this isn't a finished script. This is half of a movie, similar to Dune Part 1. With that, you're bound to have some unresolved issues with the way the movie ends. One of the biggest examples of that is The Spot. I think The Spot is an excellent villain. He starts off as a joke until he actually learns to be a villain, and then it goes into an oh shit I'm terrified level. But this movie doesn't use him as well as I would like him to? Think about it, why is he terrifying? We haven't seen him do anything villainous. It's because of the shift in his presentation as well as what he can do to destroy Miles' future that he's menacing. But beyond that, he's not really focused on. I know, I know, it's the same way that Empire set up the Luke v Vader fight in The Return of the Jedi, but Vader was already a menacing bad guy even before the direct connection Empire set up with its hero. Which brings me to another point. 
for the most part, Miles isn't the main lead of this movie. His arc has a beginning and middle here, but it looks like it'll be continued in Beyond. Who has a character arc with an actual beginning, middle, and end? Gwen. But does the movie push to make Gwen either the lead or co-lead with Miles? It does, but in my opinion, not hard enough. The prologue and a good chunk of scenes are led by her, yeah, and the ending shot does make her out to be the lead for maybe the first half of Beyond, but considering how the hook is about Miles' impact of things around him, the multiverse, his friends, his family, that causes a slight disconnect to make her a strong enough lead here. Okay, enough about Gwen having a slightly missed potential, let's shift our focus to Miles. The fact that Earth-42 Miles became the Prowler after his chance to become Spider-Man was taken away from him was an excellent choice, and is a good thematic way to bring the sequence of events Miguel explained to Miles to a new level entirely. And the best part of all of this is, it's not like it was pulled out of their asses, it makes all the sense. And it leaves our Miles in a very interesting place when Beyond starts, similar to Luke at the end of Empire. Miguel basically told him that the Earth-42 spider biting him resulted in the death of his uncle, the death of his OG Spider-Man, the creation of a multiple or maniac, and now an alternate version of himself turning to the dark side. Things that happen to him out of his own control entirely are risking the entire multiverse. That's bound to screw him up, and it's going to be really interesting to see in the sequel. So yeah, Beyond is set up to be the best film in the trilogy, and I can't wait. The March 24 deadline is a little worrying to me with the strike going on and how animation takes time but I also believe that they worked on this and beyond back to back. I hope the release of that would bridge the gap of making Across the Spider-Verse both narratively stronger and a more complete narrative resolution. Hmm, what am I missing? Oh yeah, Sandberg's all right in the movie, but I feel like it's a missed opportunity to not have Akiva there. The Lonely Island cameras are right there, guys. Okay, bye.